Hi everyone, this is just a quick video taking a look at question 5 for the English language paper Explorations in Creative Reading and Writing. So this uh, video is going to take a look at how to approach the question and how to actually make sure that you're meeting the criteria that the examiner is looking for. We haven't got too long now until the actual exams, so it's really important that you make sure that you have a firm idea of how you need to achieve those marks. If you have a look at the images that we've got on the right hand side, these are all going to be linked to what we're covering in today. So we've got the first one, the number of different letters. So that refers to the kind of things that we need to think about in terms of the language that we use in our writing. We have this um, picture of quite a, a snowy, frosty looking environment, and that is actually linked to the main topic or theme that we're going to base our creative writing on. And then lastly, we've got a structural image here that kind of gets you to think about what other elements of the paper one exam do you need to bring together and actually apply to your creative writing. The first thing I'd like to think about is can you recall the key elements that you need to use to be successful in your creative writing. Now I'm going to use one of the old teacher cliches that says it's all about the quality rather than the quantity. So in that in, in mind just think about what is it that you actually need to include in your writing to actually get the high marks. A lot of us think that writing is all about doing a really amazing story or even writing a full story in just 45 minutes, which is quite a difficult thing to do for anyone. And that isn't really where you get all the marks. So just have a think for a minute. What do you actually need to include? If you're not too sure, don't worry about it because we're going to be going through it in just a little bit. Think about any acronym that you can use to help actually uh, improve your writing. So for example, on paper two, you might use DeForest. So DeForest techniques in things like persuasive writing however there's a different acronym that you can use to be successful in your creative writing so again if you're not too sure what that is we will be covering it further on in the video as well and the mega challenge look at the second image which again is that image of that snowy frosty landscape and i'd just like you to mime up as many adjectives as you can based on that picture and this is a really good starting point when you're based with any kind of image for your question five and it just starts to help your mind to start thinking about what kind of environment you're faced with and how can you actually use the description to help create a vivid image for the reader. Look at the exam question below and attempt the challenges that follow. So the first thing I'd like to point out about this question is that you get 24 marks for the content and organisation and 16 marks for technical accuracy. Now this is a really important thing to actually break down and uh, actually annotate if you're actually doing your practice for this. So the 24 marks where it says for content and organisation, um, it isn't very clear really what they mean by that. And essentially what they mean is for the content, they mean are you writing things that have successful techniques that are creating imagery and really grabbing the attention of the reader. And when we're referring to organisation, we can talk about anything from your sentence structures to your paragraph to are you actually embedding and using some of those key structural techniques that you looked at in the first part of the paper one. When it goes on to the 16 marks for technical accuracy, this is somewhere where people often lose a lot of marks because it often just gets pushed to the wayside. So when we're thinking about those 16 marks for technical accuracy, we're thinking about your spelling, your grammar and your punctuation. Now, if you're not great on that, then there's a few things you can do to actually address it. We have um, several different things on our YouTube channel as well that go into those in more detail, especially the use of punctuation, which is a real easy way to help boost your marks as well. So a typical question you get might say something like this at the top. So you're advised to spend about 45 minutes on this section. That first bit is very important. So timing is also key. It's no good saying to me, I can produce some amazing creative writing if I had an hour, two hours to do it. But unfortunately, that's not the case in the exam. So you need to be aware of the time. You need to make sure that you are spending enough time on section B and not spending all your time on section A and making sure you're really giving yourself the best chance to get the top marks. You're advised to write in sentences. Again, that is something that everyone should be doing by now. You're reminded of the need to plan your answer and you should leave enough time to check your answers at the end. Now, this is the kind of information that we normally um, overlook generally, but it's important to actually think about it carefully. 
So when it says that you need to write in full sentences, it seems obvious, but a lot of people forget to do it, especially when you've got the um, anxiety and the pressure of being in an exam situation. A lot of the time we make silly mistakes. So it's always a good idea to check um, your actual sentence structures and make sure you're using all the techniques that you need to in there as well. When it goes on to the plan, now this is something that uh, I personally have a love-hate relationship with. Now, you won't really get any more marks in the exam for doing a plan. So the plan is only really there to help you. So if you're just doing a plan for the sake of a plan because you've been told by your English teacher that you need to do a plan, then that's not really working in your favour. You need to make sure that if you are doing a plan, that it's actually structured in a way that is going to be helpful to you and helps you keep on track with what you're trying to convey in your writing. And last one, you should leave enough time to check your answer at the end. Again, when you've got all that pressure for the exam, it is really easy to neglect all that technical accuracy. So just make sure you spend at least five minutes at the end going back through, checking your spelling, your punctuation and your grammar. And it might even be that the examiner awards you more marks for the fact that you've been able to go back over it, evaluate your writing and critically assess what needs to be improved. One of the acronyms that we can use to help remember some of the key language techniques is Go Massive. Now, it doesn't matter if you haven't heard of this before, because you definitely would have heard of at least a few of these techniques. OK, so with any acronym, how we use it is each one of these letters stands for a key technique that can help us in our creative writing. So each of these you've probably looked at before in your normal English lessons, but you might not have heard of this acronym. Um, what I'd like you to do is try to figure out what they might represent. So you can pause the video here, try and work it out by yourself. Alternatively, we also have a few clues as well to help you. OK, so clue one. So one of these um, key language techniques are words that sound like the noise they make. Clue two. Repeating the same letter more than once to add emphasis. And clue three using like or as to make comparisons. So each one of those clues refers back to one of the key language techniques that we use in our Go Massive acronym. Now, there are other techniques that we need to be aware of as well, but this is just a really fantastic baseline to make sure that you're actually hitting a criteria that's very important in this question and that you're actually making sure that you're at least using some language techniques in your writing. Class feedback. Check your answers against the ones below. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the Go Massive acronym and I'm going to reveal the answers as well. OK, so these might change depending on your English teacher. But the important thing to remember is that these are just some of the key language techniques that you can use to improve your writing. So the first one, the G then, is a group of three. This is also called a triplet as well. Again, depending on your English teacher, we have different expressions for these as well. So a group of three is where you're using three adjectives or even phrases towards a common goal. So if we think back to the picture that we looked at at the start of the video, you had a very cold, kind of bleak environment. You might say something like the weather was cold, harsh and determined to take the lives of anyone stupid enough to step outside. So even though um, the words are used in the sentence changed a little bit, the adjectives were were different and then there was a phrase at the end as well. It all is working towards the common goal to describe the bleakness of the environment. So in that case, that group of three would count as well. The next one is onomatopoeia. Now onomatopoeia is this fantastic technique where we use a word that sounds like the noise that is actually making. So we have words like bang, crash, whack, anything really there that can kind of uh, help the reader to actually imagine the kind of things that you're trying to describe in your writing. Next one is metaphor. Now, this is a really important one to be able to use um, in terms of figurative language. And essentially, it's where you're just calling something something else. Alliteration. So this is where we're repeating the same letter more than one time. And it generally works to add emphasis as well. You also have an upgraded version of this that some of you may be aware of known as sibilance, and that is the repetition of the S sounding um, letters. And that generally is used to imply some kind of evil or wrongdoings, especially when that kind of sound is normally linked to the evil and snakes and all things like that. 
Next one is simile. So this is very similar to a metaphor. The only difference is that with a simile, you're using like or as to make the comparisons, whereas with a metaphor, you wouldn't be using like or as. A sensory language. Now, for me, this is one of the most important techniques to be using in your creative writing. If you're neglecting to use the senses when you're writing your descriptions, then you're really preventing your audience from getting a good idea of what you're trying to describe. In order to actually help them to be engulfed in the world you are creating, in the actual um, plot of your story, you need to make it actually um, engaging with their senses. So they need to know what they can hear, what you could smell, taste, touch and feel. Right? These are all really important things to include in your writing. Imagery. Now, this is something that is created when you use um, any number of techniques and it just helps the reader to be able to visualise what it is that you're talking about and what they need to focus on. V, varied vocabulary. So very simply, this just refers to the fact that in the mark scheme, you need to show that you have a range of sophisticated and intelligent words in your writing. And if you think this is an area that you need to improve, then that's absolutely fine, right? Not everyone can come up with some fantastic words on the spot. So what you can do is you can go away, you can make sure that you research a few key words uh, the type of words that you can use in any kind of situation, um, learn how to spell them, and then you make sure that you can actually use them on a regular basis when you're producing your creative writing. E, emotive language. So use the kind of language that's going to actually evoke an emotional response from the reader. Nothing too uh, harsh or dramatic, just something that's going to actually make us get a physical kind of connection with the characters within your writing. If you're happy with your Go Massive techniques and you think that you use these on a regular basis, it might be important to think about the different techniques that you can use as well. So your Go Massive techniques will be really helpful for anyone that's looking for, let's like, say, just a four or a five. It just makes sure that you've got those as a baseline to include in your writing, but there are other ones you can include. For example, if I was doing a story based on things like snow, rain, wind, some really, really harsh elements, then I would absolutely think about using pathetic fallacy. So if you're not sure what I mean by that, pathetic fallacy is where you use the weather to echo the emotions of your characters. So I'd really make sure that I was commenting on the weather and the overall environment. Also, personification is a really good one to use. That is where we make things that aren't alive seem like they're actually living and have human characteristics as well. Again, there are others, but these are just a few to get you thinking. Look at the image and attempt the challenges that follow. So the image that you can see there is the one that we're going to use as our stimulus for our creative writing. The first thing I'd like you to do is to think carefully about the picture and try and identify two or more aspects of the image to help your response. Now, for the purpose of this slide, I've actually only shown you a very small part of it, but you should still be able to find two things that you'd like to focus on in your writing. The super challenge. Use the Go Massive acronym to start planning your response. So if you're a person like me who really doesn't like planning or, or never really seen how to do it effectively, then the minimum you could do is just use the Go Massive acronym to start helping you come up with a few ideas. And the mega challenge, compare your ideas to the ones on the next slide. So again, if you'd like to pause the video here, if you'd like to spend a bit more time to actually come up with some ideas by yourself, that's absolutely fine. It's a really good thing to try and test and challenge yourself with. But what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at the ones that I've came up with based on this image. Now that we can move on, start thinking about actually planning our response. I want you to take a look at the kind of ideas that I've came up with. Now, these are by no means perfect ideas, but they're just ones that are just trying to get myself thinking. And I can actually go ahead and use some of these to start thinking about the kind of things I actually want to write about. And all this does really is it just makes sure it safeguards myself by making sure that at the very minimum, I'm using a few of these sentences, a few of these go massive techniques in my writing to make sure I'm getting a top mark as well. So the first one is our group of three. And here's my example. The weather was cold, harsh, and determined to punish the climbers. So you can see there, I've got three different ideas towards that same goal. O, which again is onomatopoeia, a deafening crack broke the silence as the propeller struck the side of the mountain. Now you might notice from that example that we didn't actually see 
a helicopter approaching like a rescue helicopter or something like that and that's fine you don't have to stick rigidly to the actual image you can involve other elements and other things into your story as well the picture is just there as a stimulus which means it's there to actually help you come up with ideas and generate some thoughts about your writing you don't have to stay completely married to the picture m so the metaphor the cold was a relentless animal and if you think about that there, it actually creates quite effective imagery of making it seem as though the actual weather is a human kind of um, element or animal element in that case, who's actually out to harm the people in the story. And my last one for this part is my alliteration. So the terrain was rough and rocky. And you can see there, this is just the first few letters in my Go Massive acronym. And even then, I'm starting to get a kind of idea of the kind of things that I want to include in my in my writing. And the story is slowly starting to flesh itself out. Now, I haven't actually focused too much on the story because the main thing I want to focus on is just being sure that I'm getting those techniques in there. Because that's really where all the marks are available. So the next part of the Go Massive acronym then. So we've got our S, which is a simile. So the climbers were trapped like fish in a barrel. Now this isn't the best simile in the world. I've just got it down there because I know that a simile is a good thing to use. So it's better than nothing in some uh, cases, but the examiner might consider this to be a cliche. And if you're not sure what I mean by a cliche, a cliche is something that has been used so often that it kind of loses all meaning. It's kind of like the same thing of saying to someone on Valentine's Day, uh, you're as beautiful as a red rose. They're not gonna be impressed by it the same way no one's really going to be impressed by the simile that I've just created. So if you are thinking about using a simile in your writing, try to use one that's a little bit more unique, a little bit more um, effective in terms of the imagery that it's creating for your reader. Because the climbers were trapped like a fish in a barrel, it's just been used too many times. It's not very visually effective and it doesn't force the reader to be engaged in the writing. The next one is sensory language. So the cold invaded their clothes and engulfed their senses. Now, when I'm talking about the cold, if it actually in invaded their clothes, I'm talking about the, the sense of touch. And I'll just put engulfed their senses because sometimes when things are just so unbelievably cold, you feel it everywhere with, with your touch, with your taste, with everything, even when you're breathing in the air. So for me, that was quite a, an effective example there. I, right, so this is imagery. Their bright jackets stood out like warning signals against the clear blue sky. And you might notice, as with a few of these um, examples, that I'm actually starting to use more than one Go Massive technique in my example. So their bright jacket stood out like warning signals against the clear blue sky is actually using a simile as well as effective imagery. So you can start actually thinking about how you can put these things together and use multiple techniques in your writing as well. V, a baleful chill descended on the climbers. So baleful is a really interesting, sophisticated word to use. And it means basically like a sinister or a negative, a very, very um, uh, aggressive kind of word to use as well. So it's a very interesting word to use and would get me an extra mark in my writing as well. E, so my emotive language. As the minutes stretched on, the climbers suffered in their fight against the elements. So when you're using things like emotive language, it's not as simple as just using words like love and hate. It's the fact that I'm using words like suffered, which really helps us to emphasize with their characters. As any nice, normal person would know, you don't want anyone to suffer. So that's kind of engaging them on an emotive level there as well. Now we're going to take a look at a student example and we're going to try and go through it and identify any positive or negative aspects of the response. So this has been written by a real student who's actually had a go at a very similar picture to the one that you can see there. So it says then, the wind angrily battered the men on the mountain as they hurried to build the stretcher. The snow was as cold as ice. The men worked as quickly as possible. They know they had only a few minutes before things took a turn for the worstest. Tom breathed a deep breath and worked quickly against the really bad weather. He could feel the cold getting into his clothes and begin to touch his skin. Forcing this realisation from his mind, he focused on the task at hand. 
Jefferson's wound was bad and he had lost a lot of blood from his body. Tom had managed to stop the bleeding, but there was a gross smell coming from the wound. So what I'd like you to do now is just have a look through this example and think, is this actually a good response? Is there anything that we actually could improve to get it higher marks? And then think about how does this compare to the kind of thing that you might produce in your day to day um, normal English lessons when you attempt a creative writing task? Is this something you would uh, do yourself? Could you maybe do something a bit better? Or is there something here that you'd use maybe in an example yourself when you have a go at this a little bit later? Class feedback. Check your answers against the feedback given by the examiner. So again, we have the same student response, and now we're going to look at the feedback that was actually given by a real examiner. So a lot of schools use this kind of feedback as www, which in this case means what went well. So it's going to go through and identify a few things that actually make this writing effective. So the first thing it says then, the candidate has structured the response effectively. Now this is something that's actually neglected quite a bit when we think about our creative writing. We do focus a lot on our language techniques and the story, the actual plot, where it's going. And structure often gets pushed to the wayside. But if you think about it, if you think back to what you know about question three and how to actually develop structure, it has structured it fairly effectively. It has talked about the overall environment in the first paragraph. It has done an effective shift in focus when it changes to uh, the character Tom, who it's fair to assume is going to be the protagonist in their writing. And there's also done this fantastic little shift in focus here that's actually zoomed in, not just on this person called Jefferson, but also specifically on a wound. And it actually tells us the conflict that is going to arise. It's not just that these people are up a mountain, but it's also been structured to tell us that it's a very dangerous environment. We have a few characters here, one of which is uh, very aware of the bad weather and another one that is actually suffering from a bad wound that might put their lives in danger. The response has some language techniques. Now, if you've ever looked at the mark scheme, if you've ever went through it with your normal English teacher, you will know that using words like some is the way the English teachers like to express the fact that they haven't included enough of this particular element. So when it says it has some language techniques, it means we have a few that are actually missed out. So they've included maybe one or two techniques, but really to get up into the higher bracket, to get the higher grades, you'd need to include a range of them. So a range would be the kind of thing that takes you up to a level seven or even a level eight. Next one, the candidate has started to use a range of punctuation for effect. So you can see here, we've actually got a bit more of a positive word here. Rather than saying some, it's now changed to a range. So that actually implies that the examiner might be more inclined to give them a few more marks for their punctuation. And we can see they're using the bog standard things of a full stop, a comma, but they've also made sure that they've used a semicolon. And the semicolon, if you're not too sure what that is, is the little dot, little full stop and the comma that's used together. And it's used to actually join two separate ideas together that they're actually have some kind of link um, to them. Okay, so if we look at how it's been used in the example, it says forcing this realization from his mind, he focused on the task at hand. So you can see there's two separate ideas, but because they're quite closely linked, he's linked them by using the semicolon there, and that would actually get them a few marks in terms of the technical accuracy in the exam. So now we're going to look at the things that need to be improved. So if you don't know what we mean when we say EBI, it means even better if. So these are the things that would have helped the response to go on to that next level and to get higher marks. So the learner has made grammatical errors on more than one occasion. So this is where we start to think about how the person has lost some marks. And let's just have a quick look back over the extract and see where that is. So it says, the wind angrily battered the men on the mountain as they hurried to build the stretcher. That's fine. The snow was as cold as ice. The men worked as quickly as possible. They know they only had a few minutes before things took a turn for the worstest. So we actually have two big grammatical mistakes just in this one sentence here. So the men worked as quickly as possible. They know they had only a few minutes. 
So if you actually have a look at it, they've actually switched tense, which is quite a common mistake. Um, so no is present tense, whereas new is past tense. So they should have had, they knew they only had a few minutes before things took a turn for the worst, or they should have sticked, stuck with an actual um, tense, so it made sense. Um, the other thing that they've missed out is this word worstest here. Okay, so if you know anything about superlatives, these are things that the highest or lowest extent of something. So things like the best, the worst, the largest, the smallest, and you can't go further than that extent. So you can't actually get worse than the worst is. So we should know that that word doesn't make any sense. So next thing that the examiner is focused on in the feedback then. Uh, so some language techniques have been used but are cliche. So the only real language technique that was used in the whole of the response there was um, actually the simile. So the snow was as cold as ice. OK, so that's a really kind of lazy simile to use, especially considering the characters are stuck up a mountain that is covered in snow. And snow and ice are very, very similar and really would have liked to have seen a better example for a simile here that wasn't so obvious or overused. There's a limited use of vocabulary as well. Okay, so even though um, we're only looking at a small portion of this response, the real response should be five paragraphs long. We don't really have any evidence of any sophisticated words that are being used. Now, if you'd like to have a go at actually producing some creative writing yourself, you're more than welcome to use this student response, look at the things that work well, include that in your writing, and try and improve on the things that the examiner has flagged up as losing some marks. It's not a bad response. It's not a bad response at all, but there are a few errors there that are just going to easily lose the candidates some marks, which really makes it a shame. Using everything you have learnt, use the success criteria to write your own response. So when you're writing, you should be thinking about these key areas to actually include in your writing. OK, so the first one, you need to make sure you're using a range of go massive techniques. OK, so just for the purpose of actually working um, through the task at the moment, just try to get used to using those go massive techniques. Of course, you can use the other ones that we've looked at, but just for the practice there, get used to the acronym, get used to using it, because when you are nervous in the exam, it's all going to be down to that muscle memory and you're going to use the things that come to you naturally. So if you practice writing down the acronym, if you practice using those techniques naturally then it's going to help you more in the actual exam use punctuation for accuracy and clarity so you've got a massive 16 marks for your technical accuracy so if you're not thinking about using things like colons semicolons parentheses ellipses um, all those kind of really intellectual forms of punctuation then you're going to miss out on your marks structure your writing effectively so that was actually something that that student response did quite well. So if you're unsure about structure, go back, have a look and also think about the sentence structure as well. So simple, compound and complex. Those might seem like fairly obvious things to talk about, but they are really important things to include in your writing and they often get neglected as well. Review your work. I can't stress how important this is. You need to make sure that you're spending some time to go back over and correct any spelling or grammatical errors you may have made. Now, it's very rare that any writer, even professional writers, write something for the first time and it's amazing. They always have to go back. They always have to review, make changes and accept that, you know, it's human error. We all make mistakes every now and again. So if you're not actually taking that time to go back and review your writing, it's going to come back and, uh, and uh, act against you okay it's gonna lose you some marks so you must make sure that you're going back and reviewing your writing look at the plan on the next slide to help you get started so if you want to have a great creative writing now um, you can use the plan and see if it helps you to generate some ideas for yourself so here's our plan then in the exam then you would need to be writing five paragraphs so 45 minutes for five paragraphs it isn't really a big ask. As long as you know what it is you need to include, you should be absolutely fine. 
So this plan is just a very, very rough idea of the kind of things you could include or think about when you're approaching your actual paragraphs. OK, so paragraph one, a really good way to start is to describe the overall environment, um, focus on the weather and use imagery to emphasize the impact of the setting. So think about if it's something like that, where you can see a lot of ice, a lot of snow, or if you're um, up high in a high altitude, then the examiner has given you an opportunity to really describe that. And if you neglect doing that, then you're really going to miss out on a few marks. Paragraph two, zoom in on the central character and use showing and not telling to express how they're feeling. So zooming in is a good technique in terms of your structure, but you can also think about using showing and not telling. So that is making sure that you're rather than just saying Tom was cold. Think about how could you describe him physically to actually convey to the audience that he is feeling cold. Paragraph three, introduce a conflict. So something that must be overcome by the characters. So if you think about the example that we just read. It seemed to be either that the weather was something that was going to be quite um, problematic for the characters or the fact that one of the key characters in there had a wound, had an injury that seemed to need to be dealt with quite quickly. Paragraph four, use a shift in focus to another character and use a simile or metaphor to describe how they are feeling at that moment. So the reason why I'm thinking about using a shift in focus to another character is because when you do have a picture, um, it's not always easy to find loads of things to write about. So you could always include an additional character that is maybe not included on the picture. So you could think about using that and then making sure that you're actually using some of your techniques um, just to make sure that you're hitting that criteria as well. And paragraph five, either have the problem resolved, so they could either get rescued or something like that, or you could end it on a cliffhanger. Now, you don't actually get more marks for ending um, your story, right? So you shouldn't be in a race to write a full story in 45 minutes. Again, that's going to be very difficult for anyone to do. But if you are able to end it with a resolution or a cliffhanger, that at least shows the examiner that A, you have actually planned out your response. So you know where it's going. You're not just making it up on the spot. And you're also showing them that you acknowledge that it's not just language that actually helps us get the marks. It's actually the structure as well and the language combined that makes a real successful piece of creative writing. So if you're happy with that, if it kind of makes sense to you and you'd like to have some further learning, then attempt the extension activity on the next slide. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some typical cliches that often get used. And I want you just to think about how can we actually develop these and change these to make them more effective. So the first one is actually one that we looked at um, in the student example, the weather was as cold as ice. Now it's a little bit obvious, so it's really important that you think about how those could be changed or improved. Number two, he was as fast as a cheetah. I think we've all seen that one a few times. The tree waved in the breeze. Dead as a doornail. And number five, like a kid in a candy store. So what I'd like you to think of is just quickly just think which of these cliches have you heard of before uh, why aren't they useful in our writing so why do we want to avoid using cliches why is it not going to be effective or help us to gain any more marks and then the mega challenge come up with some ideas yourself using the go massive acronym to help create some interesting sentences now it's all well and good to say um, don't use cliches because often when we're panicking and we're in an exam we often fall to the ones that we've heard of time and time again. But if you spend time thinking about, hmm, how could I have the same message, but how could I make it a little bit more engaging, a little bit more interesting or more unique? So it's going to actually grab the examiner's attention and award me some marks. If you need any additional help or support, then new videos will be added to our channel every single week. Alternatively, you can like, subscribe and leave us a comment below and we'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. If you are still looking for more content and we don't quite have enough on here at the moment, then please check out our partner channel, Bookworm Teaching, for more lessons and guidance on all things English. Best of luck with all your revision, guys. If you need anything, please do get in touch and we'll try and help you any way that we can. Thank you.